Farmacia in Isabrejevalma. Okay. Uh, we are going to start. Um, I'd like to welcome you once again. I mean, I'm here with you for the whole week, so no need for new welcome, right? But I'm glad that you are also here at this round table. Um, we are going to talk at this round table about the European integration, about the future of European Union, about past problems, hopefully also some solutions for the future, um, with uh, some guests that um, kindly responded to our invitation. I'm really glad that they are here. They come from different fields. They have different background, different personal experience uh, in the past. And I think they will uh, be able to offer quite some interesting um, answers or comments to the questions that we are uh, addressing in um, these five days, right? Uh, so uh, from my right to my, um, uh, to, 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 to even yeah further right, scary to say this in contemporary time, right? Um, far right, yes. Uh, on my right, uh, Tanya Fayon, um, current member of the European Parliament, also vice chair of the group of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats in the European Parliament, and also journalist in her past before she became a politician. So I hope that she will also be able maybe to speak about this, um, different experiences of how to uh, cope with reality, how to, wh 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 what, wh how, what is the difference between the social role when you are a journalist or a politician. Then, uh, uh, on a bit more far right. <laughs> uh, this might change when you hear their answers. Uh, Violeta Tomic, a current member of a national parliament, and in her past an actor, actress, uh, um, even a TV host, right? So if you Google her, you might get some, you might get some videos from TV shows she was hosting. Uh, I'm also really glad, Violeta, that you are here with us. And then on the far right, um, Dr. Jure Pozga, uh, professor from the um, University of Ljubljana, uh, Faculty of uh, Social Sciences, who is dealing with uh, topics of European Union, elections, the rise of populism, nationalism, uh, the, the power relations uh, within the European Union. And he is also a former debater uh, in our debate program. He debated at the university level, right? Not at the high school level, so, so he only debated at the university level. So he also shares a specific um, background that might be interesting, interesting for you. So, thank you once again that you all uh, responded to our invitation. Now, for you, a bit of a context, uh, why we decided to invite this interesting guest, simply because what you're doing at these events is three things, right? You're learning some soft skills, you're learning some debate theory, how to critically think, how to present your arguments, right? Uh, how to critically address reality. Then secondly, you're learning about different theories of social relations, social studies, philosophy, international relations, different theories, different perspectives of how to address the reality. And then the last thing that you're learning is simply you're gaining a lot of knowledge, a lot of information on contemporary European issues, uh, political issues, and so on. And in the, each day in the evening, you are trying to use this knowledge in your debates, when you're addressing debates, topics, debate motions. And these people here are um, now will offer their own comments, their own answers, their own ideas, their own perspectives on the same topics, the same issues that you were addressing um, uh, this, uh, these five days, that you're addressing in your schools, that I hope you will also address when you go home, uh, back to your 15 countries from where you are, um, in your debate programs, debate clubs. I hope that you have your questions prepared, right? If there were any controversies at the workshops, if you do not agree with your teammate, if you didn't agree with your lecturer, teacher, whoever was lecturing, giving you ideas, if there was anything that you want to discuss, these people will be uh, more than glad to answer or comment. If you have any questions regarding the motions, right, that you would like to ask, you have at least three to four motions that you will debate tomorrow, you can ask something, right, about this, or if there is simply something that you're interested about, the topics that we are going to open in the first uh, few minutes, you are also uh, 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 able 
or encouraged to offer some follow-up question. But before I give you the podium, right, before I give you uh, the, the, the ability to ask the questions, I would like to speak briefly uh, with my guests. Maybe, Tanya, firstly with you. I would start with, I would start with this, um, uh, uh, um, what I already mentioned, right? Before you were a journalist, right, and now you are a politician. Maybe could you tell us what is the difference between these two experiences, right? As a journalist, you were dealing with uh, with uh, controversial issues, writing about them, uh, and as a politician, right, you are also dealing with these issues, but with totally different objective, with totally different goals. You are in a different communities, different circles. So maybe if you would describe your personal experience and how would you evaluate like these two different communities? What does it mean to be a part of uh, you know uh, group of journalists, group of politicians? Maybe this as a starter. Okay. Thank you, and first welcome to Slovenia for all those that are not living in Slovenia, and of course thank you for inviting me here. Um, I hope we will be some sort of inspiration for you, or maybe you will inspire us with Violeta. We are both um, in the peak of our election campaign, because we are both running uh, for the next European Parliament, so we are very busy these days, but it's good to have a, a little bit different audience that we are not just um <laughs> okay fighting for um our electorate so I, I used to be a journalist right for many years before i entered politics and as a journalist i um firstly i was working for many different commercial ra radios and the end i became a correspondent in brussels so i was in eight years following european policies uh, very close um, in brussels i was covering for national tv um, netherlands belgium france and luxembourg and it was a very exciting period to be there for eight years, especially because I was last four years before Slovenia joined the European Union and then the first four years when we became a member state. So it was interesting to see all the enthusiasm we experienced as Slovenes and as being part of 10 Central Eastern part of um, countries that were joining in the biggest enlargement uh, ever so far in 2004. But the question was, what is the challenge or the difference or between journalism and politics. I often say there is something in common between the, the journalism or the journalist and politician because we both need to um, know how to communicate with people. So we need to sell content as a journalist, you try to, of course, be credible, professional, sell your content. But as a politician, it's very useful if you're also capable of communicating well. Because even if you have sometimes a very creative or a good idea, but if you're not capable of convincing people that it's the right idea, it can be lost already at the beginning. So for me, it was very um, interesting to have this journalist experience. And as we have a topic today that we will discuss on migration. I was already as a journalist uh, dealing a lot with the third countries and doing some documentaries on um, uh, migration routes to Europe, also on um, radicalization and so on, but we'll come to that. Maybe I have a short follow-up question, right? Um, my question would be in which role, right, journalist or a role of politician, do you believe you can change the world <laughs> better or easier or in which role you can be more effective because on one hand it's really important that we have informed citizens in democracy right so it's really important that we work on you know objective uh, journalism or or quality journalism on the other hand politicians are the policy maker but are they really changing uh, anything aren't they so in which role would you do, do would you believe uh, ca you can change or address the real issues with the real proposal more effectively? I mean, if I stick to the how it should be proper, then of course media play an important role, but media is there to report um, and deliver information of what is happening in a, a credible way. So it's a source of information, while politicians are of course shaping the politics and deciding about the future. Now we know nowadays that media also have a, an extreme influence also in shaping the world, especially with all fake or alternative facts or fake news or 
uh, what we are experiencing on social media, but nevertheless, the, the politics is the one that uh, is shaping our future and it should um, be um, creative and powerful enough to do so. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe quickly, Violeta, so that we start also with the similar question, like how, how very important it is for a politician to be a good actor, since you're a former actor, right? <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, it is my absolute privilege to be here with you today, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Yes, uh, my first vocation was uh, to be an actress. And I think also our prime minister is actor as well now. And uh, I think personally that uh, actors and artists are different than really politicians. So I'm not considering myself as a politician even now. I, I'm in politics, I'm doing politics for five years now, on national level. I'm member of parliament uh, in Slovenia, I'm also a general rapporteur of LGBTI rights inside of uh, parliamentary assembly of uh, Council of Europe. So I was, <coughs> pardon, always activist and still I am now. And I think being an actor inside of politics, it means that you bring some spirit inside of this boring job, you know, because uh, as artists you always have some, some corporate culture of a person, or, or uh, Goethe would say Herzkultur, because we have a lot of empathy, we can, we can feel other people and that's why I think that artists in politics I are very, very important because we are really different, we, we, we are giving different approach uh, because we are not uh, looking at the people from the offices. Most people I met, uh, I'm traveling around now and, uh, and inside of European Parliament, I don't mean Tanya, <laughs> uh, they, they look at the people and at the world from their offices and they never really experience what they are doing with their uh, solutions to the people, you know. And uh, that's why it's very important that you come from the people. You understand people and you can easily work for the people. Okay, so maybe if we slowly move to the like the the topic of the European Union concretely, like lately in in the, um, a lot of uh, your public interventions and interviews, you were asked a question: What are the main values on which the Europe is built? What Europe really is, right? And we, it it seems that we have like two co like two competing ideas in the current contemporary times, contemporary political space, in what Europe is. Built built on. On one hand, idea of a social Europe, welfare Europe, Euro um, after w Second World War Europe, who is helping people, uh, Europe who is like anti-fascist fortress. And then on the other hand, we have this idea of Europe as something built on the values of Christianity and Christian culture. So I would ask you, what is your position? Like, what are the main values that Europe is promoting and should promote? Yes, thank you for this very interesting question and it's true, we are discussing in these days on which values Europe is actually built and for my opinion it's definitely anti-fascism and social Europe and it should be social, environmental Europe. Christian values are now they are talking about Christian values and I, I don't buy this, this story. That's why we have problem with migrations because they are not Christians. Uh, that's why we have so much hierarchy. And I, I have nothing against any religion we have to know, but uh, uh, values are, Day of Europe, for example, was 9th of May and also the birthday of our Tanya, so <laughs> we all also congratulate to her. And uh, 9th of May is a day when Europe liberated itself from fascism and Nazism, which were the, the m most evil thing we ever, ever had in these hundred years. And on these values, Europe was built. We fight against evil which many countries were around uh, were attacked 
and uh, m we have a lot, a lot of victims of this war. So after, and what is the most important about European Union is that we are experiences, experienced now 70 years of freedom, because the countries and politicians of European Union are not fighting each other on the field with weapons, but they are sitting together in the same parliament. That's one of the most important things we gain with European Union and we have to keep it and to know that it is the thing we have and we should never lose it. But even now the fascism is rising, nationalism is rising, sovereignty uh, movements are rising and we have to fight against, against it. And these far right movements are mostly promoting Christian values just to exclude other people. But we are all different religions, different skin colors, different interests, different education, but we are all Europeans. And that's important that we have to fight for these values that we are all deserve to have equal treatment in this union we have. Okay, thank you. We'll come back to that later. Now moving to uh, Jure. Jure, uh, maybe an easy question for you also at the beginning. So we, 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 we said that like, uh, you know, Violeta Tomic has this background of an actress, an activist, you know, and activists and are always uh, considered to be maybe utopian, or, and they need to be, right, because they are changing the world. Then we have a politician and a journalist, you know, objectivity, reality checks, and you are an academic, right? So what is, like, what is, what is your relations toward this utopian activism and reality checks, politics and journalism? What is the role of academic or a scholar color in crea creating better world or, or changing the world, if this is even a role of academic. Uh, how would you understand that? Yeah, thank you for uh, the invitation as well. Um, yeah, me being uh, an academic, how do I, how do I see it? Um, basically, uh, the role of the world of academia is uh, not entirely the world of sitting in office and looking, looking outside. Um, being a researcher also means that you have to get in contact with people, talk with politicians or decision makers. But uh, at the end of the day, you have to develop, let's say, a critical stance towards uh, things that you are uh, observing. So uh, the only um, credible position of an uh, academic is not to be neutral. I don't think that's the, the role of uh, uh, academia, uh, but it is, it's to have, a, let's say, a solid uh, a standpoint on something to know why you are actually uh, in favor or against something uh, and um, uh, basically it's a learning by doing process it's a long life learning uh, it's not that once you are uh, a professor uh, you stop learning and you only uh, preach outside uh, what you think you have learned and uh, what you think is uh, supposed to be the truth so uh, basically it's uh, somewhere in between uh, taking decisions uh, because you have to decide what is your position, for instance, on uh, the rise of populism and nationalism. Uh, and on the other side, of course, if you want to have a credible position, you have to be a good researcher, uh, which comes close to being a journalist, uh, just devoting perhaps a bit more time and uh, uh, being perhaps less dependent on the results that you produce, uh, because part of what I do is not just research, but it's basically uh, teaching, teaching younger uh, people um, about uh, the European Union, international relations, the way uh, things evolve. So what I'm trying to say is that my role is to observe and try to explain uh, why things are or why things happen as they uh, as they do and uh, it's not so much about uh, uh, measuring uh, the work that I do with success where I uh, it's not so much about convincing it's just uh, showing options so discussing alternatives uh, and this is sometimes I feel lacking in the academia because a lot of uh, my colleagues or older colleagues see uh, the academia as a neutral uh, area or a neutral space where you should not take uh, sides or where you should not be too politically uh, engaged and I think that uh, that's not really not not really the point because uh, being an academic also means that you have to uh, 
not only be credible, but you, you, are, you have a responsibility towards uh, things that you, well, you teach or research. And I think that you cannot uh, be a responsible or a credible person uh, by always taking the neutral in-between position take, uh, or sitting on uh, several, uh, several chairs. So I think that's, uh, uh, that's also something that I've learned uh, during my debating, uh, debating years. I think that's a, a very good uh, start of uh, uh, developing your own way of uh, thinking and uh, um, even for n not only for public speeches but uh, just the way you grow up as a person that not only works but also has to think about what are the results of his uh, his work so yeah okay so i want to ask you about your expert opinion now right on a specific topic um Violeta Tomic was mentioning how the Europe was something that was built to like uh, uh, promote peace, to promote equality, integration and all this, and how this is something we should fight for, something we should not lose. But on the other hand, in the contemporary times, we hear a lot of criticism of European Union from different perspectives. And something that you can hear a lot from different, from like, from different political point of views, from different ideological sides, so, but something that is common to all of these critiques is that there is some kind of concentration of power going on in Europe, within the European institutions, within the European economic social uh, policies, right? That we have some kind of central countries, peripheral countries, and so on. So my question to you would be as following. A, um, is this true? Like, do you agree that there is some kind of problematic concentration of power? And if yes, like, what are the examples, concrete examples of this concentration of power? And if yes, if this is a problem, what do you, th is Europe dealing with this problem successf successfully, or is there a lot of space for improvement? What are the things that we should do to address this possible problem of concentration of power? Yeah, well, uh, is there a concentration of power in the EU? Of course, there is a concentration of power. Uh, there is a concentration of power in almost every politically or economically organized community or group of, let's say, let's say people. Um, do I think it's uh, wrong as an, academics, uh, as an academic? I'm basically interested uh, on the position of states, whether they are in the so-called power circle or whether they are outside of the power circle. So, so um, it's natural that those within the, this power circle do not feel that there is a problem that we have a power concentration uh, in the European Union. Uh, those outside, of course, think that there, it, it is a problem because being in the, let's say, the power circle also means that you have uh, access, uh, more political power or more decision-making power and so on and so forth. So why, ha why have we come uh, into this position of uh, having uh, a concentration of power within the EU. This is also, let's say, uh, it has developed historically. The European Union was built as a community of six mostly Western uh, European states, with the exception of, let's say, Italy, which is um, a, a more Southern European country. Uh, nowadays, we're actually talking about the EU of 28 or 27, uh, the EU that actually consists of small states, uh, middle-sized states, and uh, let's say big power uh, states, or at least uh, big European uh, power states. So the concentration of power is, let's say, a natural consequence of uh, the fact that we live uh, together, but we're quite different. Uh, different in terms of um, political parties uh, or political systems, different in terms also of, 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 of values. Um, I could agree that uh, we do share something that could be called European values, but of course the debate about the European values is not only which this very or what these values are, but uh, how they are politically interpreted. You know, what does solidarity mean? Solidarity could mean a uh, social uh, Europe. Uh, if you ask someone coming from, uh, uh, let's say, a more central left uh, leftist. Uh, um, um, political uh, space, but if you ask some someone from the right space what this solidarity, of course you'll get a different perception. What I'm trying to say is the this power game dynamics within the EU exist and exists on several levels. So <coughs> the level that I was talking about now is the level of the interstate play. Uh, 
so we have different states uh, as units. The units are quite different in terms of its uh, geographical size, in terms of its economic power. And sometimes we see that the, the ones that we call big powers have everything. They are big in geographical terms. They're politically more important because they're uh, making or actually the ones uh, that have the most uh, decision-making powers. And they're also economically strong. But then again, we also have certain countries that are ge geographically quite small, such as the, let's say, Scandinavian countries, or at least middle-sized countries uh, in terms of geographical uh, geography, uh, but they are uh, quite developed economically. And of course, when it comes to taking decisions uh, in the area of economic and monetary union, those are the countries that others look up or that others try to, uh, let's say, be on the same, uh, on the same side with. Uh, and then we have a second level of, let's say, the power concentration. The power is not only concentrated within the so-called Franco-German uh, core, uh, but it's also con concentrated uh, uh, at the, let's say, political party uh, uh, level. So we have a strong European political uh, European uh, uh, EPP, uh, European People's Party, uh, which is the so-called more conservative uh, uh, part of the political spectrum. And then we have a second core, which is more socialist and, uh, let's say, uh, democratic. And uh, then we have several other minor or not so uh, big cores. We have the, the left uh, uh, the left parties or the leftist parties. And then we have also the so-called new parties that uh, are actually not so much about uh, placing themselves within the continuum of left or right, but they are presenting, as they say, an alternative uh, solution to the European problems. Uh, and this means that they can be even more conservative than the conservative core, or that they can be even, let's say, more liberal than uh, the already existing uh, liberal core of the EU. And then there is a third level of the power concentration, which I think is uh, sometimes um, the, the most present, we have the EU institutions playing against the national uh, institutions. Uh, we have the role of the European Parliament and we have, let's say, the role of the national parliaments when the decisions uh, at the EU level are, are being taken. But mostly I see the power concentrated within the two core uh, institutions that somehow uh, reflect the whole idea how the European Union was built. We have the European Commission, which uh, is sometimes portrayed trade as the, the motor of the uh, European integration process. And then we have, at the same time, the states represented in the European Council and the Council of the European Union. Uh, and the, the power play is actually uh, building or, or impacting on the things that we sometimes uh, uh, criticize when we talk about the European uh, Union. So what is the European Union? At the moment, European Union is what actually states want the European Union or states allow the European Union to be, which is quite obvious in the way uh, we are talking about certain, let's say, hot topics at the moment when the uh, EU uh, campaign um, is uh, going on. So when we talk about migration, I mean, we have a different position of, let's say, the European Commission as a strong promoter of what the EU wants. And then at the, on the other side, of course, we have the uh, member states position that are quite diverse. And uh, I'm not trying to say that the, the, the power concentration is bad in itself. Uh, I, I think it's someti something that uh, the EU as an institution of 28 member states can actually not, not, not avoid. Um, so yeah, this institutional uh, power play is, I think, uh, also the responsible for several of the problems that we are to be, um, that we are going to discuss uh, later on. But I think that's uh, the, the, the concentration nowadays, as I see it, is uh, less uh, on the side of the European Commission, I think that the European Commission has, has since Lisbon lost a lot of its uh, a lot of its powers. So, if you would ask me, it's less the European Commission and uh, the Lisbon Treaty, as such, has produced a system where the the states come back in. Uh, is this a good thing? Uh, I don't know, but it's uh, the reality that we have or we have to be dealing with. I mean, uh, the the two ladies. Uh, uh, 
one of them already being uh, part of the European Parliament and the other one uh, being, uh, let's say, a member of the National Assembly, uh, are the ones making the decisions, but the decisions at the EU level are not only made by uh, the parliamentarians. Okay. So, um, in this sense, uh, yeah, the, the state is perhaps more important than it, uh, than it was. Okay, thank you. Um, like uh, Jura, Jura, Jura was Jura was mentioning migrations already, right? And and probably like migration crisis, like an European Union not being able to properly respond and address this crisis, um, is is showing two things that we already addressed. A that Europe has some issues, right? After the the crisis of eurozone, after the crisis economic crisis in two thousand and eight, this is the second big crisis that is showing that European Union as we know it now has some issues and second thing that that uh, is very clearly seen in this um, in this uh, migrant crisis is these power relations and power plays between the countries, right? The the strong countries, the central countries, are kind of a strength setters in how to deal with migrants. Um, then we have some treaties, for example, Dublin Treaty, that is burdening peripheral countries much more than others, probably, right? So we this is a crisis which can like uh, on which we uh, on I which can serve as an example on which we analyze a lot of things about European Union. And I do know that you do deal with migrations a lot, right? also as a politician um, and my question would be what is your assessment of how did Europe respond to the migrant crisis in 2015 um, what happened in these four years now so how did it develop and what are the policies that we should adopt what is to be done with the people dying on the borders of Europe thank you this is a <laughs> question that demands a very long answer, but I am used to answer usually very short because I'm 10 years in the European Parliament and we have to speak really short. Um, so I prefer to say that um, there was a crisis or there is a crisis of institutions of the European Union instead of migration crisis. Why do I say so? Because um, if we put in the perspective what was happening in 2015 and 2016, when we saw the biggest wave of migrants uh, crossing also through Slovenia up to the western part of Europe, um, it was we were speaking about a million and a half of people that were trying to or irregular crossing the, the borders. Um, the numbers were not high for more than 500 million of Europeans. One million and a half is not much if we look back to the history that after the Second World War, just in Germany, we, have, we had 12 million of refugees. So therefore I would say there is no migration crisis and there was no migration crisis, but was clearly a crisis of the European institutions and a crisis of European governments that were not able to find the key how to deal with uh, migration and um, we failed on the test of solidarity in European Union. Um, up to today, when we managed to reduce the, the flows on different ways, we can discuss what we have done, but we still have a big challenge ahead of us. We never managed to find a solution how to um, have a European response, to have a European effective migration and asylum policy. We adopted um, in the European Parliament everything that was necessary already two years ago. Um, the key how to have solidarity in Europe, how to deal with safety of outside borders, how to approach the, where are the sources of, from where people are fleeing, and also how to deal in the European Union with people that are entitled to international protection. But everything, when I'm speaking about the reform of migration and asylum policy in Europe, failed in the European governments. Up to today, the European governments were not capable to agree on European migration and asylum policy. That is why today you see the borders, the barbed wires, the fences in Europe because countries were forced or due to nationalism or growing populism, that was the consequence, um, started to build fences and walls. Now, the, to make the answer really short, what I as a social democrat strongly believe, first response is always a 
humanitarian response. We speak about people, people that are fleeing because of force, because of poverty, because of climate change. We have refugees or we have economic migrants. If we have refugees, and Europe is taking today mostly just Syrian refugees and almost no one else, then we have to, it's our obligation through all international conventions and treaties to give those people an international protection. If we speak about economic migrants, then we have different still policies around European Union. But mostly Europe today became quite a fortress, if I'm critical, because we hardly legally accept economic migrants nowadays. Um, we, in the last few years, managed to build a lot of measures on the outside borders of European Union, but we didn't manage to open safe and legal ways for those that are in need to come to European soul. We didn't manage to use humanitarian visas. We are not using blue cards. Uh, we are, in fact, in a big way responsible also for people's death in Mediterranean. We are not really very effective in fighting uh, organized crime, fighting trafficking with human beings. Um, and we have a lot of uh, really nationalism and uh, populism and politicians in many governments. If I look around Slovenia, um, in Hungary, in Italy especially, also in Austria, to some extent in Croatia, um, are manipulating, creating fears, abusing the topics for different political reasons. And we are in a very negative atmosphere in European Union and also in Slovenia, in atmosphere in which it's very difficult to find really proper European solutions. I think we have to have a uh, holistic approach, meaning if uh, we have to really focus more on the places from which people are fleeing, that is very important as long as we will have wars for oil, for water, for power, people will be forced to flee. And as long as we will not stop and create conditions that people can stay and live in dignity where they come from, we will have problems also um, in Europe. And on the other hand, in Europe, we have to find back our solidarity to help people that are in need to stay in European Union. Okay, thank you. Uh, I like this like perspective from the you know European Union, like internal. Mm -hmm. Now maybe Violetta, right? I would ask you for a more global perspective because I know that you, in your public intervention, like to focus on the global picture of migration. One, and this is where also Tanya, Tanya ended, right? Like mm -hmm. that this we need to understand this in in a whole global bigger picture. One of my favorite thinkers once said that the fascism is the colonialism returning back to Europe. Right? So this rise of fascism, populism that also Jure was mentioning, has its roots somewhere else in historical global perspective. And I know that you are traveling around, you were mentioning where we were talking before North Sahara and so on, right? Mm -hmm. mm, different refugee camps and so on. So maybe could you offer a comment on that, like on global perspective about this migrant crisis or crisis of European institutions not being able to respond properly? Yes, I, I definitely agree that uh, European Union is responsible for this humanitarian crisis because as a member of NATO, we were present with our groups in Iraq, Syria, Libya, Afghanistan. That's where people have destroyed their ho destroyed homes, so they have to run anywhere for their lives. And me personally, I, I spent 10 days in refugee camps in Southwest Sahara with the people of Polisario. And I have to tell you that these people lived 43 years waiting for their right for self-determination and we ignore it. It is amazing what they built in the middle of Sahara and they are protecting our freedom, being there, because they are some kind of, uh, of tampon zone between all these people in, in Africa and European Union. And uh, what we are doing as European Union, we are signing trade agreements with Morocco. And Morocco is on their occupied 
zones selling their property and people are waiting for self-determination. That's how European Union is doing wrong, wrong, wrong movements all the time. And then we, we think that if we put fence, we are safe. No, we can never be safe because people, they want to live a proper life. And this is the only thing what we must understand. So what, what I have to say is that now European Union is suffering from lack of democracy. We have two Europes, Europe of two speeds, Europe of two qualities of life. And uh, during the austerity and economic crisis, I agree there is no uh, refugee crisis. It is crisis of humanity now. And also we are dealing with environmental crisis. It is the biggest crisis we forgot about it. And it affects everyone, poor and rich, periphery and center, and we have to tackle this problem now, immediately. And uh, during the economy crisis, the money flow was going from the periphery to the center, because European Union of two speeds is hiding the company owners in Central Europe and Europe of cheap labor on periphery. But competition between the countries shouldn't take the form of, of social dumping. That's why it is so important that we have common social standards in European Union. It is extremely important because that's why far right is rising, because they are collecti the collecting frustration and anger from the people who had the feeling that this globalization is leaving them behind because they lost their jobs they 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 just have to to take austerity measures and the uh, european union why it is lack of democracy they never ask us about very important things do we agree to build a new european army psco and to spend 13 billion euros for this they never ask us if they are, if we agree on austerity measures. They never ask us if we are free to sell very cheaply our companies, our banks, and everything. They ask us about trivial matters, about should we switch clock or not. It is not democracy. First, European Commission has unlimited power and European Central Bank, which is forcing us to have saving measures. But in European Commission, or uh, Brussels is surrounded with uh, 80,000 lobbyists. So they work for corporations, not for the people. These 80,000 lobbyists are in 11,000 groups of reg registered lobbyist organizations. And if we count, it is about 100 lobbyists on one member of parliament. But just members of parliament are voted directly from the people. And they should have more power. Second thing, what is very important is to have uh, the, the common social standards, as I, as I mentioned before. For example, uh, the common uh, minimum wages, which should be Every, everybody who is working should live properly for, from his work. So we propose that minimum wage should be 20% over the minimum sp spends uh, on, on each country. And also social, social uh, security and health security and also free education for everyone. It is obligatory. And also we have to tackle environmental crisis because we cannot go on like this. So that's why the European left strongly believe that uh, European Union is now standing on the crossroads. Will it be changed into a more social and environmental union or it will disappear? It will disappear with all these fascism, nationalism movements, sovereignty movements which are threatening Europe that they will destroy it. 
Okay. Uh, Yura, I do have a question for you, but before that, I would like to ask if there are questions from the audience. We are now speaking for 40 minutes, and if there are questions from the audience at this point, uh, we will be more than glad to take them. Yes, uh, please just present yourself from which country you are. You'll get a microphone. If you have a question for a specific speaker, just let us know and present yourself. Tell us from which country you are and what is your question. I am Patricia from Poland. I usually am a third speaker. And I have a question to Mrs. Violetta. Uh, why do you think Christian values are disintegrating Europe? Or which is the specific, what is the specific value that is this, is this integrating Europe? Because I, as a Christian, am very curious about that. Thank yes. You for the question. Yes, of course. Christian values are okay, but Muslim values are also okay. And Buddhist values are also okay. And people who are not re religious, they have values as well. So we cannot say it is only Christian value which creates European Union, because it is not. You can be Christian and I respect you, but you have to respect me as an atheist. And we have to ex respect every human being on this earth, not just Christians. Okay. Did I answer you? Thank you very much. We Thank had you. another question back there, I believe, right? Thank you. Thank you. I'm Anita from Estonia, and I have a question for the MAP in this room. Uh, I have actually two questions which are really related. Uh, First, firstly, what do you think about uh, far-right parties that are trying to get into the European Parliament and uh, about that many far-right par parties want to do not want to leave uh, uh, EU after the Brexit, but they do still want to change the whole merit of Euro European Union? European Union. Uh, do you think that it is dangerous for European Union, European Union's future, and why? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And I will start with a um, lesson we have learned with Brexit, because Brexit, I think, was to to big extent a consequence of a very dangerous populism. Maybe you remember Nigel Farage from the European Parliament. He's quite outspoken, a European eurosceptic. Yeah, it's a very dangerous one. Um, but I don't know if any one of you know that um, he and his family have German citizenships together with his children. So for him, the future with Great Britain being outside of the European Union will not be very bad because he will take care for the family. But what I wanted to say is that um, I think three years ago, now it's three years from when Great Britain had a referendum, um, the same day I do remember there was a question mostly raised on Google, um, what is European Union? The same day British people in the evening were Googling what they have done. Um, because it, it showed us that they didn't know what they were really voting. They had a lot of wrong information. And um, it's also clear that we, we've seen now three years of very chaotic negotiations because they didn't have a plan how to really go out of the European Union. And I do think that longer we are waiting, it's becoming more clear that maybe they will stay in the European Union. I start believing so. And uh, British colleagues are going again for the European elections. What I wanted to say is that sometimes we see this um, dangerous populism that doesn't bring the clear answers. And this was, um, to some extent, also the lesson in Great Britain. And I do hope maybe they will have a, a second chance to, to decide. Maybe they will decide the same, but at least on clearer facts. And yes, I'm, uh, I'm worried, but not as worried as maybe a year ago when I saw we had a, a lot of uh, growing nationalism, extreme right, far right in Netherlands, in Germany, in Austria, in Italy. For I Italy is for me still phenomena today to see what's happening. I can understand also that was a big uh, consequence of migration because Italy was very much left alone, but still, um, after Brexit and maybe after Trump, I think we managed to um, somehow stop this growing nationalism 
and far right because Europeans became afraid. Um, became afraid of common challenges that we have. It's the first time I see this year in Eurobarometer in countries that there is not a single member state that would wish to exit European Union or better, there is uh, a growing support to European policies among Europeans after maybe 10 or more years, they feel they want to have more integration where we have common challenges. So that gives me some optimism that maybe, and also we went, we, we have to know in European Union for the last 10 years, we went through several crises. And crises are always um, um, times when people are afraid and it's, uh, it's a perfect platform for nationalists. Uh, to, to create fears, to manipulate and take over the control. And now when in Europe we see the uh, recovery of the economy, we see the, the um, higher um, employment, um, people are getting a little bit more calmer, more confident in European politics. And this is, I think that, and I do hope that the European elections at the end of the day will not bring so many nationalists and uh, far-right or radicals to the European Parliament that we maybe feared a year ago. I do hope we'll manage to somehow shift that trend, but it is a very dangerous trend for the future of strong and united Europe if they will very much change the structure of the institutions. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Maybe also for Dr. Poshgan? Yeah. We have it. Okay, we can start here, sorry, and then we go there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Sami from Belgium. Uh, we are here with the youth group. Um, we are all uh, Muslims. So uh, our question uh, to Violetta is, um, what do you think the future for the Islam in Europe will be look like in like 30 years or something? Because we want to know, um, it's conference uh, all day, like when we're going to uh, school or to the club, we can get in in the club because we're Muslims, and we want to know uh, for our children how it will be look, uh, how it be like uh, in two years. Yes, thank you for your question. I was born in Sarajevo, hero town. We lived together, Christian, Orthodox, and Muslims, all my life, and also in Syria. All religions live together in peace. So, with Islamophobia, even now, far-right politicians, they say, you have culture of cutting heads, raping people, and so on. It is terrible to talk about one religion's religion like this. And now we are facing uh, religious wars all around. It is easier the easiest thing on the world is to change, uh, to, to, to push into the war neighbors and friends on the religion matter. It is so irrational because every person is, could be just good or bad. Every religion has its bad and worst things. So uh, I cannot answer you what is your future and future for your children in European Union. But I deeply hope, and I will stand for it, that every member of European Union, no matter which religious is his, in his origin, will have the equal rights. So that's it. Thank you. Um, before I give you a um, chance for another question, maybe mm, Jure, we heard a lot now, a lot of things that that are fueling uh, the populist movements and populist rhetorics in the Europe. So my question is for you, because I know that you also work on dealing with that, like what is the main cause of the rise of populist rhetorics, populist policies within the European Union? Like are these things that we were now discussing, religious wars, uh, migrant problems and all this, uh, are these the things that are fueling the rise of populism? And maybe even more importantly, how do you believe this will affect the co upcoming elections? Will, will this like change the power relations between Europe, all these uh, rhetorics or, or not? So 
what is the main reason? How do you see this? And how will this affect the uh, elections that we are waiting now? Yeah, to, to start at the end of the, the, the first question, I would say that the uh, issues around migration, security and terrorism are just being used by populist or nationalistic parties uh, in order uh, to gain the votes of uh, the, the people. Uh, the real problems or the real roots of uh, the rise of populism and nationalism in the European Union is, as I see, um, first foremost, if we see uh, and take a closer look and at how uh, populism and nationalism has risen in the central and eastern uh, European uh, countries, uh, actually the, the more newer member of the European Union, uh, we could come to a conclusion that basically it has risen because of the uh, disappointment of the people with the European project. So uh, if the hopes were quite high before 2004, before the entry of these countries into the European Union, then actually the European Union has not uh, met its expectations. Um, what were the expectations? The expectations were, of course, to be uh, economically viable, uh, to be uh, as developed as the, let's say, core Western and nor Northern uh, European countries. Since this was not the case, why not? Because we had a European, uh, or not just the European, but the worldwide financial and economic uh, crisis. Uh, these expectations were, were, were not met. Uh, on the other side, when we look uh, beyond the Central and Eastern European countries, we can see that the populism and nationalism, nationalism is not only uh, a Central and Eastern European uh, phenomena, but it has for long already existed in uh, the core countries, um, and even in uh, some countries that we thought of are especially liberal and open to, uh, let's say, everyone, uh, such as the Scandinavian model that has proven not to be as effective, as open, as tolerant as uh, we all knew. Uh, and even uh, certain countries that were, let's say, liberal because of their past, because they were uh, former colonies, such as, uh, or former colonial empires, such as uh, Great Britain and France, are actually the ones, especially in France, facing, let's say, the biggest rise in nationalistic uh, uh, movements. On the other side, we should not actually uh, mistake the rise of populism and nationalism with anti-EU anti sentiments or, or with Euroscepticism. Uh, as I think uh, Tanya already said, not all uh, populists or nationalists are against the EU. Uh, with the exception of the Great Britain, I think, for the majority of the European states, uh, being anti-EU is uh, actually not an option. Um, uh, if anti-EU means uh, we want to exit the European Union. So what we see now is uh, the, let's say, link between populism and nationalism with a bit of more skeptical views on where the EU should develop in, in, in the future. And if I come back to the first, let's say, answer that I was giving is, it's actually not my personal opinion, but I have to, uh, for my work, I have to also be able to understand uh, how a populist or a nationalist or, uh, let's say, an extreme far-right uh, person or a politician thinks, uh, and why the EU is actually closing it, its borders. Who is, who is it actually? When, when we speak about the EU, and this is sometimes uh, my frustration, uh, the EU is not doing something. The EU is uh, fault, or the, it's actually the EU's responsibility to do something. But if, if I ask ourselves, who is the EU? Foremost, the EU is us, the people, and we are represented in Brussels by our, uh, let's say, politicians uh, at the state level or at the level of, uh, let's say, politicians or the members of the European uh, Parliament. So when we see or when we think that the EU uh, is not doing something, we should actually ask ourselves, why is this so? And this is also or foremost because there is an institutional, let's say, division of powers within the EU. The EU can only do what states entitle the EU institutions. Uh, and if the, let's say, states disagree that we should have a common asylum policy, then this is something that we as citizens uh, 
have to accept. We do, not, we do not need to agree with it. We can oppose it. We can try and, let's say, go to the European uh, elections and vote for the parties that are speaking in favor of having a common asylum system and so on. So in this respect, it's, it's, yeah, it's somehow frustrating because uh, my personal opinion is, of course, that what the EU is currently doing, uh, not only with the plans to have a common asylum policy, but also the plans about the European Union, uh, uh, army is that it actually just proves how far away from the people uh, it is or the people's wishes it is and this is uh, also giving let's say some leverage to all the populists and nationalists that are using this dissatisfaction uh, uh, of uh, citizens with the EU institutions uh, in order to gain votes. Are the populists and nationalists providing any solutions to the problems? No, of course not, because their only solution is that we should just oppose the ruling elite, that we should oppose, uh, let's say, the Brussels having its, uh, its own say, and that actually the national capitals should decide upon their own fate. Uh, and this is especially paradoxically in terms of how they uh, the countries were dealing with the economic and financial crisis. I mean, we blame the EU institutions, but at the same time, the populists were actually making the arguments, although we are the one that are actually, that have actually caused the economic and financial crisis for ourselves, uh, we should not think about solutions beyond the state because it is the state that can actually uh, uh, solve uh, the problems of, let's say, uh, an enormous public, pub public debt. And we see that in a globalized economy, we cannot think that way. I mean, the EU is there. Uh, it has to be changed, transformed, uh, but you cannot fight it in a way that uh, you say the only option is to to keep all the competencies at the state level and 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 uh, actually not uh, uh, not try to be the, the part of the common uh, common european market so i think that uh, these are also sir, some concerns that will need to be addressed uh, in let's say the twen post 29 uh, uh, future so the future is actually in our hands but not only us as citizens, but also politicians. So it's not just the European elections, but also the national elections. And especially you as young people should, should be aware that uh, you have to take part in elections because these are the only ways how, how we can actually uh, change something. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will give you, yeah, but please be short so we can ask more. Uh, I'm questions. always short. Um, uh, I have to disagree. I have to disagree with this that we are to blame uh, for the economic crisis. It is not true. The economic crisis was triggered by unresponsible speculations of big, big banksters. <coughs> banksters. And uh, we have to solve this, this problem with enormous debt. And uh, for opinion, on opinion of my party, the left, European left, uh, the neoliberal capitalism is just another part of the same kind of uh, far-right populism because we never, never triggered this crisis. And w uh, during the time when we are tightening our belt and we, we impoverished our state budgets, our hospitals, our education system, the number of billionaires doubled. Okay. Thank you for the short answer. Okay, so now we do have some time to accept more questions. Firstly, there. Yeah, so can we do it there, please? <coughs> yeah. So I'm Benjamin, I'm from Hungary, and my question is open to the whole panel. Um, you always talk about the future and the values of the European Union. Um, I would like to ask that, how can we talk about the future when such things like the climate crisis is a very crucial issue, but the European Union is also recognized it, but not really doing anything to tackle this issue. And also I have to say that um, because of the climate change and the climate crisis, um, migration happens. Millions of people migrate to Euro Europe because of um, they, they are losing their habitat. So why don't the European Union focuses on promoting a uh, greener lifestyle, sustainable lifestyle, and um, tackling this problem as a whole? Thank okay. you for it. I'll ask Tanya to answer this one. Um, 
I wouldn't completely agree that European Union is not doing anything because we have a clear agenda how to reach the, all the climate targets and we are a soft power here and a leading power in fighting uh, climate change. It's true we have uh, commitments on the European level, the different or the challenges, how much the national governments will really be able to deliver, how well we will be able to transform old industries also in this country. Um, this is a challenge. But just recently, and I have to say we did some steps in the European Parliament, we abolished, for example, plastics, um, plastic bags, plastic for the first use that will also disappear from the shop. So it's not to say that we are not doing anything. We were very much, I, I can say also, um, I very much supported the protests of young activists all around Europe uh, for the environmental fight. Um, we also invited uh, Greta to European Parliament. Uh, it, were, it was the Conservatives actually that they blocked. Uh, we invited her in our political group. We had a discussion with her also in the Environmental Committee. It was very good to see young people to, to care, to see them active and to see that they can be a leading force and it matters to them what is happening with the planet. And I do hope that will continue. And we also have very strongly in, in our agenda, I, I mean, if you uh, try to create jobs and work and uh, life in dignity, you have to know that people have to live in a healthy environment. They need to be healthy. That means also they have to have uh, drinking water, they have to live in a clean air and so on and so forth. This is all connected and it has to be part of our agenda if we really want to, to preserve um, our continent. Violetta, you wanted to add? Yes, I, I have to add that what is doing European Union now is just greenwashing. We have to do and to, to launch comprehensive plan how to really immediately start to build different Europe green Europe. So we're proposing Green New Deal for Europe because European Union doesn't need uh, uh, austerity. It needs investments, investments in green technology, in green infrastructure. For example, investment in, uh, in uh, common high-speed railways, because we know that uh, in the Central European Union we have very speed TGV, but uh, in my country you can travel 100 kilometers three hours and a half. So this are project which will show European citizens that European Union is taking care about them. And also we have to, to, to uh, invest in researches in green technologies. And also uh, we have to, 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 to share this knowledge with other fast development countries as India and China. It is necessary if you, we really want to change something because climate change is really the biggest, biggest crisis which is tackling Europe and the whole world now. And if we will not face it today, it might not be tomorrow. Thank you. So we promised a question here, yes, <laughs> a few minutes ago. Yep. Uh, my name is Ted, I'm from the Netherlands. Um, and I have a question not really specific to one of you, but to all of you. Um, the question is about the United Nations. Um, there's a council for safety, if I translate it correctly, when there were like eight or nine countries in there, and uh, respectively seven of those eight countries, the council for safety, they are the biggest weapon exporters of the entire planet. Exactly. My question to you, to everyone here is, how can we as a people, one, believe that we can change anything because those fucking powerhouses, sorry for my language, yeah. those powerhouses, they have all the power they need. Two, how can we trust our country, any country? Because we know there are, they have their own agenda. Mm. Thank you. Jure, you were given the microphone. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I have uh, the answer how we can uh, change something. Uh, you were most probably thinking about the uh, Security Council. Uh, the Security Council is also an example of a very uh, 
or a very vivid example of a power concentration. So what happens if we uh, establish an international organization, uh, we establish, uh, let's say, organs or bodies within that uh, international organization, uh, we have the principle of each state being equal to uh, all other uh, states, but then again we also give uh, certain countries more power because uh, without them or without giving them more power there would be no United Nations. So the actual question is what would happen if we would abolish a special status, for instance, for US, China, Great Britain, France, and so on, or Russia uh, in the Security uh, Council. Then most probably there would not be a Security Council at all. Would, a better, would the world be better off without the United Nations, or in this case even with the European Union? I have my own doubts. I, I, I doubt it actually uh, very much so, because there are certain problems that we have been discussing now, now, such as migration, terrorism and so on. They are global problems. And you cannot attack or you cannot address migration or environmental problems such as climate change uh, only by focusing on what the EU is doing, because we should actually put the question in a more global way, what the world should be doing. Uh, and who is it actually uh, that we speak when we think about uh, uh, the world? You know, the best thing to change the way the United Nations function uh, would be to start at the bottom. Uh, at, well, with all of us as people, uh, people of certain country, people of, uh, let's say, citizens of Europe and citizens of, uh, of the world. Because the politicians will obviously not change. They have no incentive for changing if people do not go, in extreme cases, out on the streets and protest <coughs> against a militant uh, policy of, let's say, certain uh, member states of uh, the, the, the United Nations. So I, I, I don't really have a, a question uh, or an answer uh, to your question because I, I think that this is, uh, I, in ideal terms, I agree with you. I mean, we should not, we should not allow things to happen. But we, could also not, we can also not expect that the politicians will be the one making the change because they're obviously not going to be making the change. Oh, yes, we will. Uh, definitely, you have to vote for those who want the changes and not to have status quo because status quo is good just for elites. And what you mentioned is correct. You cannot trust the government who is supporting the weapon industry because PSCO was idea of the biggest producers of weapons, Germany and France. And of course, European Union easily can give 13 billions of euros for new weapons and European uh, new army, but they can invest in the things which will provide life, not that. Well, uh, as I mentioned before, for fast railways, common railways around the Europe, or uh, uh, fast internet, many, many, many towns, many, many countries, they even, young people, they even don't have access to internet. It is the shame of European Union. So what you can, and also you cannot talk about green policy if you support war. Because war is destroying our natural environment more than anything, than any industry. Because we know it kills everything. Okay. So see, <laughs> thank you. Vote okay, for so a change. So since Tanya also says that she agrees with this answer, and since we are running out of time and also your attention spam, it seems, um, we are going to accept three more questions together, and then we will ask uh, the, all the three speakers to address these three questions and give also the concluding thoughts, because we know that they're also uh, continue or they just need to visit their families uh, for the weekend, right? Um, okay, so three more questions. Let's go from the countries that did not ask any questions. I see Finland there, I see Slovenia there, so that we have firstly Finland, then Slovenia, and then I'll ask Nena and Lucia to figure out for one more country that didn't ask the question. Firstly, Finland. Um, hi, so we've talked a lot about like green policy and like EU's decision on like um, how they're going to act on climate change. However, the most 
probably the most efficient way would be carbon caps and like stopping carbon emissions. So what is the EU's plan regarding that and why haven't they taken more action regarding that? Okay, so we have the first question regarding the Green Europe and carbon deal. Then we have a, have a question from Slovenia here, right? And Nena, please pick the third one in, um, in, in between. Yeah, let's go. Uh, hi, I'm Nate. I come from Slovenia. I have a question about nationalism more towards that, the parties. We have seen a rise in like nationalistic parties in France, Germany, uh, Erdogan, Turkey. And a lot of these people who are influenced are usually teenagers. A lot of these who support these nationalists are teenagers or young people. Why doesn't the European Union, for example, do programs to outreach these children or, or to these teenagers for a more democratic approach to them to explain to them why it's actually actually bad. Okay, so the second one on nationalism and then uh, the last one, we have it in the last row. Uh, I'm Melda from Lithuania and correct me if I'm wrong, but to my mind the intolerance and the like homophobia and Islamophobia and so on comes from the lack of empathy of the people, like of the citizens. And uh, how does, uh, so my question is, how does the European Union have any impact in changing the mindsets of the people regarding that they have like the uh, charter of the fundamental rights and so on? Okay, so regarding the climate changes and like uh, Green Deal, uh, nationalism and uh, the last question, empathy and tolerance and then also concluding thoughts. Uh, Violeta, you may start. Okay, me and Tanya will... Uh, will uh, share these questions. So I, as an eco-socialist, will answer on ecology uh, questions. Um, because I'm deeply, I deeply believe that in capitalism, it is impossible to fight for climate, climate improvement. Because capitalism, neoliberal capitalism, is promoting unlimited growth. It is not possible in our limited planet. So we have to turn completely our approach and our way of thinking to more social, to more ecological. And we have really to act immediately. Because the goals of, of Paris, uh, uh, Paris goals for 2030, that we will, we will have just 40% of, uh, of uh, carbon dioxide, it will not happen, never, if we, if we continue the way we are doing. So Green New Deal would be the only possible way to really start with investment. We cannot go on like this, because now capitalists pay more, it is greenwashing, and he can pollute more. Okay, we, we also abolish plastic bags in Slovenian parliament and all, but this is just a little, little, little drop in the ocean. So uh, nationalism, what was the, you will take, uh, have nationalism, and the la last one was, sorry? Yes, uh, I think that uh, it also come from the system, which is not just system for everyone. Uh, Max Hopheimer was philosopher during the 30s and he said who is, who is not able to talk about capitalism should remain silent about fascism. It always grows like this. If you look at the history, you will see in 30s of previous century, it was completely identical situation like now. But then they were talking about Jewish people in the same language like they are talking to Muslims or to refugees now. It is extremely dangerous. And for example, you have a tree and the capitalists come and say, you are so strongly indebted, so I will take away this tree from you. So you grown 10 apples and capitalists took away nine apples from you and you have just one apple. And you have to feed your family, your children, your grandparents, and then capitalists come and said, watch out, refugee will take away this one apple. Of course you will fight for it. Okay, uh, Tanya, especially on nationalism question, right? Yeah, but I will just touch quickly that I'm also an eco-socialist uh, and I see that you are mostly in this room. I think we all agree that we should have started a fight long ago and not now, but the reality is that it costs 
the reality is whenever we discuss environmental measures, also in the European Parliament, you see mostly three quarters of the chamber empty. These are the conservatives, because they have a lot of income, a lot of money, wealthy industry. It's not in their interest to fight climate change, because who will change the expensive car industry today over the night? It's a lot of loss. So we have to be just loud. It will be a slow process. It's a costly process. And especially for all these multi um, corporations and companies, this is not in a big interest. That is the reality. That it calls for an action. On nationalism and for young generation, or on what it is in a way related question. In Austria, for example, it was clearly a phenomenon when young generation were voting for extreme right. And I was also wondering why is this happening? Two years ago, we had an, a very high um, youth unemployment in European Union, a really high youth unemployment. And even today, we have around one third of young population still on the edge of poverty, which is a lot. And young people, when you discuss with them, feel very far from the politics, from being active citizens, even though there is a huge potential. We often discuss why is like that. And I think this is the answer. Firstly, young people like to be revolutionary. They would like to have new ideas. They would like to that their voice is heard. They see that. Um, they are not maybe, when there are elections, high on the voting list. There are several, I think, uh, questions uh, one can tackle. I don't have one or simple answer to that. But what I do see today is that European institutions are really trying, in this European campaign this year, engage a lot young people. Because in Slovenia, for example, five years ago, we had a turnout on European election 13%, which is extremely low and was one of the lowest turnout. Even in Brexit, it was the lowest turnout among young population. And that's why it, there is a growing awareness we have to make young people more active through different mechanisms, maybe with a voting right of 16 years. I don't think this is the only answer. I'm not even sure this answer can solve. Also, the EU elections, uh, electronic election is uh, online elections and things like that. And young people are today differently challenged than my generation was. You have online media, you have a lot of information around, you have to be more creative, you have to be more fighting for your future and for your jobs. It is different environment, really different environment, and a lot of challenges. So I do hope you, at least you here, are not going to nationalism, I am certain, because you care what is happening around you. And just for your question on mindset, this is an extremely difficult question. What is happening the, with the basic European values on tolerance, on solidarity, on respect of human rights, on democracy, on freedom of media? It is uh, a lot in danger in Europe. In several countries, we see that democracy is really under the threat. Also, the freedom of media, it's really deteriorating and other freedoms that we created. This is, of course, because we discussed um, um, before, for you as young generation, what I see a challenge, you grew up in European Union. You grew up in the freedom. You never experienced more or less war, violence, persecution. Um, for you, European Union is something that is um, given in a way of freedom of movement, of having possibility to study abroad, having Euro, not waiting on the borders. It is for, for us, we have to communicate today, 60 years after the European Union was created, European Union different, the politics different. Because you don't understand what does it mean to have a war, or most of you don't understand, some most probably yes. But today we have much bigger challenges around us in the world of globalization. And this is where you as young people have, have to care. And there we have to come back to basic values that is Europe created and was based upon. And this is democracy, human rights, solidarity. And this is also what we are 
especially fighting for that this Europe would become a better place again. Okay. Thank you very much. I will now ask uh, Dr. Jure Pozgan for some concluding thoughts. We are here for more than an hour and a half. So maybe, you know, short comment of what you've heard now. Maybe also, of course, reaction to the three questions that we uh, just got. Okay, I'll just come back to uh, the fact if we want the EU to do more, then first of all, we should allow the EU to do more. Uh, if we ask ourselves why is the EU not doing more in terms of educating uh, the youth about the uh, dangers of nationalism and so on and so forth, uh, one of the possible answers is because there is no EU in the educational systems of member states because there is no uh, common uh, educational uh, EU uh, policy. So one way forward would be to allow the EU to get into our school's curricula and let's say then it could do even more. Uh, but even in uh, not nowadays, the EU is actually doing a lot. It is uh, co-financing this very meeting that we, we have. Uh, the EU is very keen on um, let's say, supporting uh, migration of uh, not only within the EU member states, uh, but within the broader European uh, area. The so-called Erasmus uh, uh, Plus programs are uh, actually, in certain countries, the only source for students uh, and pupils to go outside of their countries and experience uh, something else than, ju than, than their, uh, uh, let's say, very closed mindsets within, uh, within their, uh, their countries. Um, and then if we think a bit outside of the box, I wasn't trying to attack you in a position of a politician, uh, but if you are proposing, uh, let's say, to uh, the end of uh, the capitalistic system, then I should also think that we should think about alternative ways of uh, political representation. So then the representational political systems that we nowadays have is perhaps not the best. We should think how to increase participatory uh, uh, democracy, uh, we should think about more direct uh, uh, ways of uh, how we allow not just uh, politicians but also everyday people uh, to take uh, decisions and, and shape not only their local uh, politics but also at the national EU or even uh, at the uh, world level. But the road or the path to change is never never easy. And when we speak about migration or climate change, uh, we all should be aware what it costs for these changes to happen. And uh, we should also be aware that we're actually the first one where the change should actually uh, start. So uh, yeah, I would uh, end it uh, to that. And you as a, a very young uh, uh, people are actually the ones that will be stuck with this planet uh, and these societies for a lot longer than than we are so i think that uh, this should be an extra motivation for you to really go out and and, and vote or go out and participate in decision making when where you are allowed to Okay, thank you very much. I thank all the three speakers for uh, their answers. I think that you all got some really nice ideas to think about, some really nice uh, provocations, some food for thought. Uh, so I'm sure there will be a lot to debate about. Uh, again, uh, thank you that you responded to our invitation. I uh, I was reminded that I need to say that Violeta and Taina, they, they all brought something uh, for, for you. So each delegation can take something, uh, some badges, and gadgets um, uh, uh, in the in the in the room outside. We will put it. We will put it on the desk there. So thank you, thank you also for this. And also we will ask all the people to make a photo together also with our three guests uh, to because if you're not on the social media, you do not exist. So we will make this photo now outside as soon as possible. Thank you very much once again and enjoy the evening. <laughs>